That's Mike. And that's Toya. And this is Tech, Tech Beats, Beats and, and Bites. Bites. Man, it's a lot to talk about today. <laughs> a lot. Like it's never a lot to talk about. Not like today, though. Today just feels a little different. Mm. Well, let's dive right on in. So, I was late because Uber and Lyft are on strike. <laughs> Were you really? <laughs> <laughs> I, I ain't know you, <laughs> you ride share like that. See, you just got to look outside sometimes. Um, so Uber and Lyft were planning a strike today ahead of Uber's IPO. Um, Uber and Lyft drivers were planning a two hour strike in several major cities around the world today. I uh, wonder, do those major cities didn't even include Miami? No. We weren't included? Mm -mm. I guess we're not major. Um, so an effort to this is meant to coincide with Uber's forthcoming of their IPO. Labor groups are organizing the strike or protesting the company's payment and labor practices and they hope to stymie the ride hail Stimmy, what is that? What? Yeah, you were fine. Okay. Stimmy. During <laughs> the crucial morning rush hour. Nobody want to work on time. <laughs> on the day before Uber is expected to debut in its public market. So the workers are demanding fewer driver deactivations to end upfront pricing and a cap on the per fare commission taken by ride hail companies. We knew the problem was coming, but did we expect we were going to get here this fast? Probably not. And I think it's more so related to the the quick rise of both Uber and Lyft right. and them going public is, you know, they came in as the Mavericks, right? So taxis have been around for years and then Uber and Lyft entered the scene and it's like new solution. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but wait, <laughs> now regulation is starting to set in. Ain't and nobody getting paid. <laughs> right. Ooh, ooh. We still broke. Right. Meanwhile, taxi drivers, like, we've been over here <laughs> organized for years for a reason. So I, I think that's the interesting part of this. Like, it's, let it's, us get this tea. Right. It's the, growth, it's the growth curve of both of those companies. And because they do something that existed already in a very organized fashion, they just, they, they're getting into that space. Well, Bernie Sanders, of course, has come to the rescue. And he's given his input. But mm -hmm. the employers are definitely looking for better paying benefits. But should they actually get better pay and benefits or should you kind of have protested against this before you started driving? So some of the people I know who drive. Oh, you know drivers? Yeah. I don't. They don't. They like their checks. <laughs> like I've never heard somebody complain about the extra money that I know who do it. Are they full time drivers? Though? No, they're not full time dri yeah, drivers. They're why. like on the side. Like, hey, let me just turn this on real quick. Give me some extra cash. So maybe it's for those who are full time drivers. This may be more of a situation. And then I was reading too. So they have the Ride Share United, which is sort of like their formulating union that is starting to happen. And they were saying that they're asking the public to support drivers in their struggle for fair way, um, for fair wages, and as well as their driver's bill of rights. But they're also calling for community standards that will ensure that Uber and Lyft do not create needless traffic and pollution. So by boycotting mm -hmm. Uber and Lyft for 24 hours, passengers can show that they stand with RDU or Rideshare United in their fight for a rideshare industry that truly serves those who live in LA, because that's where um, RDU is, basic, is based. So could it have anything to do with the fact that they've also made this statement? Further, we are investing in our autonomous vehicle strategy, which may add to driver dissatisfaction, which may add to driver dissatisfaction over time as it may reduce the need for drivers. So basically they're saying the humans could can't be drive too. good enough. So we're gonna get rid of you guys and we're gonna figure out a way to make this work without you. And they probably like, wait a minute, Especially because Uber and Lyft were huge players in the gig economy. So you have a lot of people who were going into the gig economy and leaving their sort of traditional nine to fives. So to hear like, oh, thank y'all for helping us to get started. But now we about to replace you with robots. They probably like, wait a minute. This was my out. No. <laughs> y'all tripping on us. So do you see this as an impact in South Florida? Because, I mean, we are becoming a place where commute is becoming hard. We have a yeah. lot of people. But... We're so A to B anyways, I mean. 
right. just another car on the road. Right. Uh, for us, you know, taxis was never a thing in South Florida. We just didn't have that culture. It wasn't like New York. It's not like Chicago. Taxis was not something that you just used like that. But Uber and Lyft, people use, especially with sort of the urbanization of Miami. You're seeing a lot of people move back into like downtown, overtown, Wynwood, Midtown, all of that little area. So those who live there, they Uber and they Lyft. So if they're about to, you know, the strike, I'm sure though there are those, I know some people who actually sold their car because they moved downtown and that's sort of where they, they live and they rely on Uber and Lyft. So they're probably a little pissed today. So I guess we'll have to watch this play out. We'll see how this yeah. goes. I would like to know how to strike like what kind of impact and what kind of unity was there because you know some people like i can't miss this money right some people can't afford a day off right and then too you know what's the what what is the next step after the strike like are they looking to sit down with the ceos what is sort of the plan of action what's you could strike but right. then like okay great Striking thank you <laughs> <laughs> thank y'all we'll for speaking it, up come back to work tomorrow <laughs> right <laughs> Don't lose this gig. Meanwhile, back on the street. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I guess we can go ahead. What are we drinking today? Sat him way far away. Sorry, y'all. Mango, mango, mango. So mm -hmm. cheers. cheers. Let's see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Summer ready. Summer breeze. Need some barbecue. So what exactly was that again? People aren't remembering their password. Everybody hates passwords, so good news, they're about to die. After 10 years of account breaches and Home Depot constantly giving away my credit card number <laughs> every time I go there for some reason. I had to stop using Shade. the debit card. I had to start using the Amex. Um, account breaches reveal that many companies of all sizes do a terrible job at securing passwords. Mm -hmm. Home Depot. To address this, Mobile Iron has upgraded its suite of authentication products products to allow IT managers to abolish the password, relying on mobile devices for the, what it calls a zero sign-on access. Part of this sounds good, another part of this is already starting to sound scary, because it's more of what we've talked about before where your whole life becomes reliant upon a mobile device. Mm -hmm. The firm relies on security features and modern hardware coupled with other signals to make a no password login as secure as one with a password. This is starting to fear me already. This kind of reminds me of um, when you start going through everything with, uh, what was the uh, movie Tom Cruise? The was microchips in? or your yeah, eyeball. Yeah, Minority or... Report. Mm -hmm. Minority Report. Yeah, so in Minority Report, it just seems like we're about to go through this phase where RFID chips and everything is there. But the whole approach is once you've paired again, one platform, you've enrolled proven sufficiently that who you are and on a given device uh, requires biometrics, biometric scientific elements, people, a fingerprint or a facial scan and right. password doesn't provide any additional assistance. So I just see a lot of people getting knocked out. <laughs> fingerprints <laughs> stolen. Fingerprints are they just holding the phone over them. So I believe this could go in the right direction, but this is starting to scare me. Yeah. Because that means it's just a whole bunch of biometric data that can be hacked into and stolen. Because it's not like people are just looking over your shoulder still in your passwords. It's where all of this data is secured. So if we have even more personal data like fingerprints as well as biometrics of facial recognition, which could lead to people creating identification and other elements, mm -hmm. I don't understand how this is becoming safer. Right, and maybe they'll say, like, you know, when you do the whole thumbprint or whatever it is, it's encrypted, so, you know, it gets all scrambled after you do it. Who knows what the sort of specifics are. But to your point, there's a trend that we're getting into where sort of cyborg <laughs> is right. becoming kind of real. People are kind of looking forward to fusing with machines in very unique and interesting ways and this sort of, you know, DNA pass, whether it is like a thumbprint or you have some sort of a microchip that's just like your unique identifier, it'll happen possibly in our lifetime. Look, they trying to bring it, make it happen. So y'all about to be living in Minority Report, whether you like it or not, I was about in to say, more ways than one. So the foundation, yeah, ooh, that was a good one. So the foundation of the security bothers me just because of everything that's going on. So granted, it could be time to kill the password. I just don't know if this is the way to do it. I think maybe every password should just be like a random series of numbers. 
mm-hmm. because numbers are much harder. But we kind of got better with the special characters. But you know, people are doing like I love one, two, three. Ask <laughs> words. Mm-hmm. Uh, I thought Google had a good solution when Google offers a strong password, which right. then stores it in the Google Chrome, so you don't really have to remember it. Yep. Uh, but so with the consumers, uh, I don't know if this is going to be a good thing, but I don't know if we can hold security together this way. I just feel like it's setting us up for something much worse. And the future can be as simply as again. So mobile iron. I just stare at my device and my device knows it's me and the enterprise opens access to various services that I need. I don't understand how this gets away from your bias of what we already have going on with facial recognition. It just yeah. seems like a problem waiting to happen. Dun, how you dun, guys dun. Feel about that. Right. Let us know what you think. So Robert Murray said he worked on something like that about a year ago and there's a potential for security issues, but I think it could be done safely. That's what we're saying, Robert. I mean, it just yeah. seems like it's a larger issue waiting to happen. So how do we get past this? So something for you guys to chew on. Mm -hmm. Now we get into the stuff that we love to talk about politics and tech. (laughs) Cause it's that season. So yeah, it has started. The FBI is cooperating with Silicon Valley to stop election meddling. So translation, the FBI is working with tech giants to stop Russia. (laughs) Or are they really? So typically you hear about people providing information to the FBI. When it comes to effort to stem election meddling, the FBI has become the source of information. On the eve of last November's midterm election, Facebook announced that they had taken down a network of fake accounts. Me and Facebook already got problems, so (laughs) y'all just took down the accounts that weren't paying. Um, Due to possible connection to Russian government linked to a troll group. Almost everything about politics has been linked to a troll group. So this is taken down as a result from a tip to the U- from the U.S. Um, enforcement. So during the hearing this week, the FBI director, Christopher Wray, there are other things going on on the news besides what we're seeing with Trump and Bill Barr. <laughs> when supply leads and information to the social media companies, there's all kind of ways they can leverage their own tools and kick some of these accounts off of their platforms very, very quickly in a way that would be hard for an agency or government to do when there are a lot of success stories in that regard in 2018. Is this going to be a basis of greed that they're not going to shut it down as much as we think? Or do you think they're actually going to try to fix that problem? Because it's not like they didn't make a lot of money from those platforms. Uh, So side eye. (laughs) (laughs) I was trying to give them some hope. Right. You know, you know, I just. We clearly know (laughs) that our government it's tied in with Russia in some form, shape, fashion. Trump had a problem and talked to Putin to determine it wasn't a problem. Right. Then he called him after this whole thing comes out and be like, yeah, I know you was cool, man. I'm just checking in. Right. right. Hey, hey, buddy. <laughs> I just want you to know we took care of everything. Hey, buddy. Like, what's really going on? So, yeah. I just think it, you know, it's probably a little bit more smoke and, <laughs> smoke and mirror type action smoke, than anything. All smoke, no mirrors. Right, than anything else. I mean, we'll see. We'll see. Especially because if the public demands it, then maybe the FBI will actually get into it and do it. Look, the FBI is more interested in trying to, like, shut down Black Lives Matter <laughs> and other stuff that's really not a threat well, we start in the U.S. <laughs> than actually focus on stuff that's a threat. You open up that door. So maybe we still have some faith in Bill and Melinda. Bill and Melinda are now working with Election Guard. This is Microsoft. Um, Earlier this week, Microsoft announced Election Guard, a free open source software development kit from their Defending Democracy program. Mm. Election Guard will enable end-to-end verification of elections, open results to third-party organizations to secure validation, and will allow individual voters to confirm their votes were correctly counted. Sounds like everything Trump wouldn't want to see happen, Um, you know, because he wouldn't want to have to verify what he's lost by. Microsoft has partnered with major election technology suppliers and are exploring integration of Election Guard into their voting system. They currently have partnerships with technology suppliers for more than half of the voting machines sold in the U.S. I do not understand why software like this is not put into legislation and why these things aren't made standard versus voluntary or optional. How are we really trying to protect democracy if things like this are third-party software 
that's optional for use. Because they're not, <laughs> they just want to talk about it. And if these so solutions are in place, you said it. then you're not gonna, they're not gonna have anything to complain about, right? So voter fraud, when we know voter fraud is really not a huge issue, but it's a huge talking point. It's a yes. part of the narrative. So this solution obviously starts to whittle away at that. But look, they're not really going to try to roll that out. But I'm, that's cool that they are doing that and they're providing a solution, hopefully to your point that it will become something that is just standard. And it's not like, oh, yeah, let's add Election Guard to our our system this so year. So real quick, I think we should get into some of the parts of the major benefits that this will protect against uh, voter tampering. It's verifiable, allowing voters and third-party orgs to verify election results. Secure, built with advanced encryption techniques developed by Microsoft Research. Although Microsoft has been heavily and is heavily one of the most spammed and corrupt systems, so kind of feel kind of weary about that. Audible, uh, supporting risk limit audits and that help assure the accuracy of elections. Open source, free and flexible with the ability to be used with off-shelf soft hardware. Make voting better, supporting standard accessibility tools, improving a voting experience. And the Election Guard SDK, uh, that's a standard uh, development kit. Yeah, standard development kit, or also known as software development kit. Yep. Will be available through that. GitHub beginning this summer. So you can pretty much download it and put it into place. Yeah. Florida. Sounds like a good option, guys. Florida. Especially for those who like to talk about voter fraud all the time. Florida. <laughs> Florida. Listen. If this isn't used by Florida, Florida, we have a problem. So <laughs> some of these issues, as you can see, guys, we just have to address because we can't get riled up because this is turning into a whole nother show. We're waiting for the white <laughs> bullet to come back on before we go way into our politics. Right. But these are just little teasers, little breadcrumbs, keep you coming back. Because what we want you to do is pay attention to the things we put out. Because a lot of times right. we drop stuff, episodes before, and they come back to light, almost like to haunt us. So these are like the ghost of tech beats and bite pass. <laughs> <laughs> we just let we you We screwed y'all. <laughs> we let y'all know it was coming, but... It's up to you to listen. So, Cold Blue is about to have a whole new meaning. Mm -hmm. That's a good one, Toy. I oh, appreciate it. I don't know what you're talking about, so let's, <laughs> let's get into it. Thanks to new machine learning tools, research and police departments can use behavioral data to find the earliest signs. Officers may be flouting policy or at risk shooting an unarmed civilian. Yeah. Ooh, the mm -hmm. blue stripe is going to take on a whole new reason. <laughs> so, I'm just going to read this first part and then you can dive in because I want to let you lead this one. To build the algorithms that may one day be able to build a risk score mm -hmm. for police, researchers are using familiar tools. Why don't you tell them about these tools to give these officers a score on Listen. their racist acts? <laughs> right. So, so the data, so we know body cameras exist, right? So that's going to become a part of building this algorithm. So data from police body cameras and squad cars and the internal reports usually kept locked in police departments away from researchers, including information on officer suspensions and civilian complaints. And that's one of the things that we know a lot about. Those who end up being a part of these incidents tend to have a lot of civilian complaints and nothing was done about it until they end up shooting an unarmed civilian. So Lauren Haynes, the former associate director of the Center for Data Science and Public Policy at the University of Chicago, helped design a statistical model to predict when officers may become involved in an adverse event, anything from a routine complaint up to an officer-involved shooting. So since the Justice Department began offering millions of dollars in grants for body cameras in 2015, and advocates began clamoring for the technology, police have claimed their cameras have fallen off, become suddenly unplugged or exploded, and then their footage accidentally deleted or never filed. So the whole idea of creating this risk score is to really sort of mitigate those people who are trigger happy, who we know are already sort of in situations and have a history of behavior because if we look to the past, we can sort of predict the future. So that's what this risk score is all about, is about helping to really sort of stimmy a lot of that 
from happening is somewhat like Minority Report, but in reverse, because it's helping to actually curb a little bit of what we've been seeing in terms of police shootings. It's providing a real solution and a tool that can inform and help to mitigate some of this from happening. So it's, it's really interesting, and I'm interested to see how this becomes implemented, what happens, and also, too, one of the companies that is creating these body cameras is also pushing for this to happen because a lot of the officers, like I mentioned, have been talking about, oh, it doesn't quite work well. The technology, uh, oops, or they don't turn it on at all, they turn it off. So that, too, is a part of the risk score because if that's the behavior that they've been exuding, then why are you turning it off? Like, what do you have to hide? Mm. So that's going to start to come out. So, again something to keep your eye on so i just want to know what happened to the basis of double redundancy like why haven't they invented something where when this footage is starting to stream it's just automatically it's automatically put into the cloud, cloud right i mean most of these officers walk around with cell phones or you provide them with cell phones for work so why isn't that just bluetooth in and there should be something that triggers you know how like um Almost like a sensor of motion detector yeah, or something. So once you've moved, it shouldn't even be a manual thing. Right. Once you've moved, uh, uh, I would say at or least two feet away from your or car, something. Yeah. it should automatically trigger and turn itself on. Yeah. Agreed. And it should be going to a smaller, even if not a actual cloud, it should be connecting to Bluetooth wise to a smaller server or some kind of trigger to a device that's actually on the 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 car the cop car right where it's collecting that data and doing everything and where it's protected to where you can't turn it off and you can't tamper with it right and why aren't there microphones on the front of the police car so we can hear better conversations of what's going on yeah and one of the things that came out too in the study uh when they were working on the algorithm and sort of the model is that oftentimes these incidents happen when police officers are outside of their district or outside of their area where they're familiar. So they're in a new space. They don't quite know the people. So then they become a lot more jittery with the situation and become more trigger happy. So, so again, for those of you who are activists, who are in this space, look into this Talk about it. Go to your city commission meetings. Go to these events and Please bring this information up because that's how you're able to bring the solutions actually into your neighborhood. Learn about it. Talk about it. Be active in it. And, John, your question was, will it take into consideration of traumatic experiences the officers encounter as well? I think the whole point of making sure that the footage and all this data is captured is so you have a full story. And it's fair. It makes it more fair if you're actually capturing all this footage and backing it up. No one is sitting talking about the discrepancy of what experiences are had between the citizen and the police officer. The fact that the matter is to capture all that data so you have a clear perspective. Point in case, the new video that was released from Sandra, Sandra Bland, Bland. I was just about to say. When Sandra Bland was able to show her perspective of what actually happened, that footage was gracefully deleted and was not present in anything that we saw on the public platform when they were talking about her case. It went from the incident from her or the car and the footage was cut, placed in her on the sidewalk. She was able to record 36 seconds of footage that was gracefully, accidentally, or once again, malfunctioned of data that was never shown. So where was that 36? Because we could hear all the other stuff he was saying. And as you can see from Sandra Bland's video uh, from her camera, it wasn't that like at that point he lowered his voice or he started whispering to where that footage shouldn't have been shown. So how many years has Sandra Bland been dead and we're just now seeing this footage from her cell phone, from her mobile device, and we still haven't had any notation from the police department that they did capture that footage? Where's that footage at on their end? This is right. the problem we're talking about. Right, because if it just runs and it's an unbiased record record of what's happening or recording of what's happening, then you're able to see everything yes. and account for everything and not just what the officer wants you to see from the incident. And changing perspective is about seeing all sides. And the more angles and the more data you can capture, the more footage right. you can capture gives Better us a story you can story. tell. So that's where we're going with that. So 
this is now so at this point this is where you should go grab your tea your drink and maybe some whiskey because it, it, it just gets toastier from here this new tool will help brands make advertising more inclusive <laughs> uh oh I got an idea just fire a lot of people and get more people of color in there and more women first of all let me just let me just move the color for a little hire more women as executives let's start there Proven success when a business has females as executives. Hire more female executives. Have more diversity to understand the basis of inclusion. Because we've had this saying that we've said it before and we'll bring it back. Being diverse is inviting a lot of different people to the party. Yeah. Being inclusive is asking everybody to dance. Y'all got the diversity part. Mm -hmm. Kind of hand, <laughs> if you consider that. Know. But let's get to the tool. <laughs> yeah, Warden <laughs> I'm about to snap. Warden says the advertising industry spends twenty billion dollars every year in commercial production, and ad agencies have tremendous buying power. That's very true. Mm -hmm. But what they're trying to do is have a broader scope of gender identity, race, and sexual orientation. That still seems to be lacking. We don't need tools. We need human empathy and understanding for people to just, I'm sorry, I can't even read through all this. <laughs> we, <laughs> we know the problem. I mean, the problem is beyond obvious. If you don't have a connection with different communities and you don't have a diverse input of your product and of your advertising, you're going to make things that exclude people. I don't, you don't need a tool for this. Unless the tool is going to be called Common Sense Sensibility Development Kit. Maybe we should make that up. <laughs> we should package that up and go to all these major corporations. Y'all didn't need Wharton to tell y'all this. Right. Did y'all really need Wharton to tell you this? Mm-mm. It's like going up to Siri and be like, hey, Siri, am I racist? <laughs> 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 Oh, right on, Siri. Siri, chime right on in. Hey, look, look. <laughs> First of all, that was not planned, but that worked at all. Mm -hmm. Siri can't give you a feedback on that. You heard her. <clears throat> she doesn't have an opinion because that's not a human. That is a computer. That's gonna be one of the best clips we ever had. Did that voice? <laughs> did that part come through? Did it pick up? Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> back to it. I don't know what tool can fix this, Latoya. I, I just... Me either. <laughs> our APEs give us great stuff, and I believe this came from um, Rosie. Mm -hmm. And Rosie always dive deep. She's very high into technology, and Rosie is one of the black women that deal with the fact of how smart she is right. in the executive world and computer science and engineering and everything. With the debacles and everything we have, is there really anything that's going to fix this problem? Is there actually a tool that can fix this problem? So if anything, it may help to highlight the problem. So maybe you can upload. So maybe it does like an analysis of your ad campaigns. And it hits you back with some stats. Like your ads have 5% <laughs> African Americans, 2% okay. women, 1% gay, white, male. Who knows? Whatever. Right. So then at least that way you can make an informed decision like, OK, if our target market or our primary buyers How you gonna tell if somebody gay are mannerisms. Right. We know some. So we know in advertising you try to like there are certain things. Listen, whatever. Anyway. <laughs> no, but for instance, in acting on film. There is a way that gay men are portrayed most of the time. And it's stereotypical. It is very stereotypical. Not trying to deny it, but that's how they write it. I'm not the writer. That's how they write it. That's how they portray it. But, um, but speaking to, or even just stating it, right? So, you know, like in some of the different ads that they have out now that are talking about, which is insane. The one that they have about the pill that you can take to help with... Um, <laughs> <laughs> if you're engaged in sexual intercourse with someone who has HIV, right? So they have different people who are targeted individuals for that particular product right. in the ad. So if they were to put that through the tool, then they could maybe figure out some data that then tells them X, Y, Z, you need to influence or add these other people into it in order to hit your target market. Okay. So grow maybe your Maybe it's circle. analytics. 
Grow Your Circle was created by Forsman Bonfors in New York. It's an open source database that allows U.S. agencies and producers to search for and find underrepresented talented, including those that identify as LGBTQ+. That's what it is now? Mm-hmm. Okay. Inclusive. Come from diverse backgrounds or live with a disability. A cross-production dis- disciplines including film, digital, and experiential marketing. It me- <laughs> This is just depressing to me, though. It menus filters talent based on expertise, location, or category, especially in a database is also searchable based on whether it's a female or a minority owned business. We've had tools like this in place forever. We we have this problem in industries, we have this problem in uh, minority led businesses for government contracts. Mm-hmm. But how do you implement the tool and make sure they're actually using the tool? There's, n- there's nothing you can do to force these advertising agencies to even use the tool. Like, you got to get the people that run the agency to admit they actually have the problem. If they don't admit to the problem, what are we actually solving by having this tool? I, I think, you know what? Sherelle Dorsey, I'm calling you for this one. This this is a story you need to write up. Let's, let's do a deeper dive on this. I just want to know, do the advertising agencies think they have a problem with their inclusiveness? Let's remove the tool right now. I just want to know if the advertising agencies feel that they have a problem. Can we start there? Top 50, so. top 50 advertising agencies that have the highest gross income and have the most visibility based it off of those two categories, reach out to them and ask them when representing their clients, do they feel they have an inclusiveness problem when marketing to the United States of America? Start with those results first, and then you'll realize why I think this tool is a waste of time. So, anyways, Amazon is now offering money to its digital publishers, which is good. Amazon has been proposing deals that would pay publishers money in advance to expand their international online presence in consumer-oriented shopping sites. Amazon has approached several American publishers, including the New York Times and BuzzFeed. BuzzFeed. Um, The deals would bring new shoppers to Amazon when consumers click on affiliate links embedded in on publishers websites. If the deals are successful, it will be the first time Amazon has paid a publisher to advance to making specific kinds of video or content. This bothers me because I feel like we're about to get into more advertisement or advertorial content where people are writing more clickbait content just to make money versus to actually, we already have a problem, which the Knight Foundation is trying to address, American journalism is trying to address. We already have a problem with content not focusing on local issues and actually addressing issues. And you can find one story and it's pretty much covered by the same people because everybody's trying to be the first just to have a clickbait and to get click throughs. I feel like this is just going to decrease the value of our journalism even more. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, when we talk about Amazon, Amazon is a bit of a loaded topic, especially when you talk about independent businesses or independent or small businesses, because it's such a huge, gigantic platform and and a force in the marketplace. But it's become a very necessary outlet for so many. And when you think about the influence that Amazon has, like a lot of people make money off of Amazon. And a lot of businesses also go out of business because of Amazon. And we have to sort of mitigate Amazon's role in our lives to a certain extent. Um, But that requires consumer awareness because while Amazon is very easy and it allows us to press a button and get stuff delivered to us, there's consequences to some of that. So Amazon, this is going to be my ass. Jeff Bezos, you probably would never watch this, but somebody that might be close enough to you might see this over in the valley. You're rich. You're the richest man in the world. Your company is filthy rich. Why not use this money to reach out to the smaller journalists and the smaller papers and the smaller sites that are actually reporting news and issues? And won't you just pay them to actually be able to get more news and issues out there? I believe, if I'm correct, I believe Jeff is a Democrat and he was 
voting for Hillary and not for Trump, correct? Yeah, I think so. But let's, oh, let's that ma- that a lot of times that doesn't matter. Let's just say even if we remove that, why don't you just use your good to actually get more factual information out there so we can remove all these elements of fake news and robots and trolls that are filling it because we would have more small organizations with funding to do the reporting, investigative reporting, and actually get more, I wouldn't even say positive content because a lot of stuff in the news isn't going to be positive, but to get more truthful content out there and allow these reporters and journalists to have a livable income so they don't have to write for six different papers and they can do deeper dives in the story and get more factual information to the end people, which are us, the readers. Why not do that? I mean, I don't know the financial situation of the Washington Times. I definitely don't know New York Times or BuzzFeed. But I just think that money could be used in a different way. Mm-hmm. We need to focus back on local news. And independent news outlets that aren't tied up in advertising dollars. Right. Because, I mean... I'm surprised you just didn't put don't don't he own the Washington Post anyways? Don't Amazon own the Washington Post? It seems like this is just a strategic way for you to filter more money to your companies anyways. You rich, man. You're you're rich. You're the even when your wife hits you for this oh, she about to stick it to you, but you still gonna be one of the richest dudes out there. Like get money and do well in the world. I don't know. Maybe that's just a lot to ask for these days. Uh, that is correct. Um, Washington Post, the boss of Amazon, Jeff Bezos, agreed to purchase the Washington Post for two, $250 million. Mr. Bezos, Mr. Bezos is buying newspaper and other print properties in their capacity. The Post is on high ground. So, there's, mm-hmm. there's just a basis of greed. And with that information, it just to me confirms more that you're not doing this to make an impact for the basis of publishers to actually get more content, it's just another money-making revenue. I, I wonder, I just want what I wonder what is this number? When is enough enough? <laughs> when have you made enough money where you can take some of your money and start paying your employees better so they're not sleeping in the parking lot? It's like how much But is money? it money-driven or is it more so like influence, power, he's and not, like control? It must be power because he's not, right. it's not influence of impact. The impact is lost to me. No, but not really. Amazon is like, completely integrated into our lives i have an amazon app on my phone (laughs) look right alexa like it's everywhere it's infiltrated so much of our space probably more so than we realize and because of that i mean amazon prime you got the fire stick it's audible i mean it's everywhere and i think that that's more so his aim is to just continue to control so many different aspects of the market and the industry and to have an Amazon flag. It's almost like conquering, right? So, ooh, put a flag on that. Let me put a flag on that, flag on that, flag on that. And then you kind of sit, sit back and you like, I did good. I got I a flag on everything. So I'm just wondering when is he going to have a bigger goal? When is the, when is the goal become impact at this point? So moving along, I told you this was deep. I just want you to know this next one. <laughs> When the water cooler combo goes virtual. Listen, y'all ready? Go ahead. (laughs) So the world is quickly moving towards mobile and remote work. We know that. (laughs) We all work remote. It's just what's happening. So 43% of the U.S. labor force worked remotely in 2016, according to the 2017 Gallup State of the American Workplace Report. This move to mobile and remote work has been heralded as a tool to increase productivity, save money. But while overall productivity increases, collaboration and integration with coworkers decreases, which can potentially lead to social isolation, decreased creativity, probability and decreased probability of promotion and raises and more. So you have a German startup company called Hollow Meeting. They've developed software from Microsoft HoloLens that lets teams collaborate and interact remotely in mixed reality. So if you're not familiar with the HoloLens, it emerged in February of 2017 as one of the first mixed reality devices. So unlike virtual reality, which we're all very familiar with, Mixed reality blocks out, so back up, virtual reality basically blocks out the real world entirely. In mixed reality, you see the world around you, 
but augmented with information and images that comes through the software. So it's an enhanced version of like augmented reality. So basically, Hollow Meeting is allowing companies to hold meetings in a shared holographic workspace. Within this workspace, particip participants can share 3D and 2D content, and everything that is shared in the workplace becomes visible to everyone else in the meeting. So it's almost like you have a go-to meeting in a headset, but then you're also in a virtual space and you probably have like a virtual whiteboard that you all can draw on together. Mm. And then you can have your, your water cooler. So it's so probably like a whole little holographic like office and you got a little water cooler. Y'all can all walk over there and like talk about stuff at the water cooler and then go back to the conference room. It's interesting. It's a, it's a new take on sort of this whole new space that we're getting into. So I think co-working space definitely helped with some of this yeah but i think this is cool i definitely wonder where's magic leaf in this just, just waiting for y'all to come out with something drop a product please please um for some reason i feel like there's gonna be a lot of inappropriate things happening <laughs> on this platform. you had a champagne room <laughs> I, the locked door to your right i is just a champagne room i, I just feel like this is a risk, but I think it's definitely great. I do believe human interaction, especially as a creative and when you're developing, you can only do so much remote. At some point, you do need to right. touch, see, and Some interaction. Be around other humans. Um, I wonder if it really does sort of make up for that human interaction. Like, if it is a really good next, like, best solution, next best solution, or if it is just like, all right. I don't really want to wear this headset and talk to y'all. Like, I'd just rather do a video conference. I don't, I don't know. I wonder if it truly does sort of fill that gap. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not huge into VR either. So maybe for those who are already in that space and like that space, it may be a good solution for them. So would you, would you dub it to remove the workspace? Because, you know, as we're getting prepared to open our co-workspace. Mm-hmm. Do you see this as a solution for those that are working remote? Like, do you see yourself implementing this for digital grass? Like, we ain't got to meet. Everybody just get your hollow lens <laughs> and jump on a meeting. I would say so. I would say we should give it a shot. Look, send us some hollow lens and let us test it out in the space. And let you know what we think. We'll do a whole influencer video for you. So this is how it worked for us. Well, uh, we can we have some in the co-working space and then some remote. Put it on and have a whole meeting and see what happens. Test it out. All right, guys, we know certain things you've been waiting for and almost everything you've been waiting for is about to happen right now. It's about to get really saucy. I can sell water to a well, well, at least craft water. I don't know how this stuff is happening, but it's happening. But some interesting points in here. Netflix creative director, which everyone that watched Netflix, y'all know those intros on Netflix be pure fire. Mm -hmm. Those intros, the Netflix original intros are just works of art. This is the only time when you don't want to skip the intro. You at least watch it at least three to four times. <laughs> right. Netflix creative director just got $1.6 million from big names to launch in tech to launch a company by the name of Liquid Death. Liquid Death <laughs> is water in a tall boy can. Tall boy can for those that don't know. <laughs> I was about to say you're going to break that down. Is a can that's like slim like this. It's larger, but it's normally a can primarily used for beer. The cans themselves are made out of aluminum, which for beer it keeps a process from what we call with Timeline Brewery and other breweries. They'll tell you it's called skunking of the beer. So that's why certain beers do not go into clear bottles. And that's why a lot of your beers you see are in brown beer bottles. So it prevents light and heat and keeps the beer cooler, which keeps the bacteria and the fungus and things from growing within the beer because you have yeast that is fermenting so you have live active things in there so he's tapped into his role of being punk so basically what we're finding out now from um this gentleman i i, I forgot to put his name but i think it's alex cesario but he's basically saying the straight edge punks which are the punk rockers you remember from the 80s and the 70s and the 90s that are now sober and they don't do drugs and they don't drink. So y'all don't sober up. <laughs> they want they want liquid purified water. Actually, I'm sorry. To be clear, they want mountain water. So 
I don't know if y'all remember, I think it was about three weeks ago, we made a post and we also talked about on the show about people in New York going to the bars and drinking virgin drinks and being sober. They're not drinking as much. See how this trend is starting to follow? Aluminum cans are actually more environmentally friendly than boxed or bottled water. And also from his view, they look cooler as well. <laughs> Liquid Death plans to donate five cents from every can sold to help clean up plastic garbage from the ocean. Nice, I'll buy it for that. Okay. If you think about it, it makes sense. Everything metal and punk is extreme. Cesario said, now this is the part that was very interesting to me. Mm -hmm. Being vegan is extreme. Protesting defrost defrostation is extreme. Deforestation, excuse yeah. me, is extreme. There is more vegans at a heavy metal show than a t Taylor Swift show. Just remember the name Taylor Swift. We're going to talk about her later too. We are by far the most sustainable option for packaged water which is a big driver for why people want to buy from us. Now, I will admit when I first read this, my post on my Facebook page says why. So if you just read the headline, the headline is a why, but this is one of the articles where he actually gives you the why. We had a gentleman that made a statement on my page and I'm gonna read to you what he said. Mm -hmm. They sell them water in a bottle, glass and paper cartons, LL, why not a can? What this article really shows is that this man is so well connected with uber rich people that he was confident that he could pitch just about anything to enough of them and generate millions in startup funds. Upon the headline and upon the initial read, I would agree with his comment. But he had an actual justifiable reason for mm -hmm. use of aluminum. A market. You have an overuse of plastic and plastic is killing our oceans. Aluminum is easier to recycle and more cost effective to recycle. And it actually does keep your drinks cooler, which is why they put beer in aluminum cans. I don't know if this is actually a bad idea. No, I, I'm actually digging the craft water. Con I'm not digging the liquid death. Just <laughs> right. Because water gives life. Yeah. The thing like for you to be. The but I get the direct, punk. I don't get the punk because it's. The whole thing was murder your thirst. Like, I feel like that's something Aisha Curry should tell Steph Curry. <laughs> what? <laughs> yes. Yes. Oh. Oh, that was. You gonna give me that one? <laughs> Y'all ain't got. You and the director. <laughs> oh, Aisha Curry today. Y'all will figure that out later. If you ain't heard Aisha, I'm just. Aisha, we understand what you're going through, sweetheart. You're a beautiful woman. Just don't nobody want to compete with stuff. It's just like, you know, we'll get to that part, too. <laughs> so, I don't know if it's really a bad idea. I think the craft water thing is going to work out for them. I'm not sure that I would buy it, but I do feel guilty every time I use a plastic bottle. I'll tell you that. Yeah. I try to reuse my plastic bottles as much as possible to make, like, my little energy drinks to go to the gym. Absolutely. And what's interesting, too, is that it's not too far from what's already on the market, right? Perrier has been in aluminum cans for forever. All the, like, bubbly, the new sparkling water that's on the market is in an aluminum can. So it sits right there on the shelf with everything else. So this is what I'll say. I will invest if he will get LaCroix off the shelves. Because <laughs> that water is horrible. If he can get that water off the shelves... <laughs> <laughs> Every store you shut down and get LaCroix off the shelves, I will buy a case. <laughs> You're rich. I'm not. So I can't do case for case. Right. Every store that you get LaCroix off the shelves, I will buy a case of liquid death. Just they have to be totally off the shelves, not selling anymore. That flavorless pop. That, <laughs> that, that Boca Ooh, Raton the, water. The, the hate. <laughs> the vitriol. So now in the Hilarious. beats, Mayo Cella starring Taylor Swift. If everybody who had a chance to watch the Billboard Awards, Taylor Swift pretty <laughs> much duplicated or tried she to. tried to <laughs> right. duplicate Beyonce's performance. So I'm going to ask you, Toya, because we need an opinion. Mm -hmm. Was it a nod 
or was she just straight jacking? So I'm not a Taylor Swift fan anyway. <laughs> so I think she tried it. <laughs> Let's get right to the She point. straight tried it. I didn't watch the Billboard Music Awards. Me neither. I and I did not on. see her full performance. I did see some clips on social media. And I was like, wait a minute, what? You tried it. <laughs> That's and a it's good just a t shirt. Wait a minute. What? <laughs> like, I just think she, she overstepped her boundaries. Like, that's not your culture at all. Like, stop it. First of all, Taylor Swift, there's something that we should tell you. But from again, the I, didn't, of HBCUs. I didn't see the whole thing. I didn't see the whole thing. If somebody uses FAMU and you can't book FAMU, don't book a band. End of discussion. And the band, just like, so in the photo where she's standing, like, in her superpower pose. That band looked like the a band high school looked band from a the suburbs. The band looked a hot mess. They was like, all right, we just here. <laughs> like, it was, it was very sad. Taylor, Beyonce had FAMU, the marching listen, 100. Listen, listen, she tried it. At your worst case scenario, you was at least supposed to get GSU, Alabama State, or Tuskegee. I don't know who you had in that band. That that band was offbeat and uncoordinated, almost like you are. You. I'm not a fan, so it don't You matter. can't do that. You had this Kanye thing. You had your whole little hater. This was too far. And I get that she is often like a fangirl because she will root hard for everybody when she's in her seat. She's like, oh, go, girl, go, girl. But this was like, this is when the whole imitation is flattery stealing. is like, stop. No, it's not. That's just you tried it. Have a seat. Thank you. I think that's enough. Don't do it again, Taylor. I know you probably don't watch the show. I'm sure you're trying to figure out the next thing you're going to steal. But <laughs> don't, don't do that again. It's like cultural appropriation. Stop it. And, you know, you got to understand the difference between what Beyonce, I still, I'm not going to put too much out of this on Beyonce's version of uh, Frankie Beverly, uh, the driver. We have fun doing it, though. Yeah. Mm hmm Look, just don't do it, Taylor. Beyonce can get away with certain things. You just can't. Mm -hmm. Just make it that simple. She's Beyonce. Taylor Swifton is not a verb. Bayhive, Beehive, Beyonce, like, won't even say her full name. It ain't Beyonce Knowles Carters. It's just Beyonce. All the greats end up with one Beyonce Prince, the greats. They just, <laughs> one name. Sade. You're still Taylor Swift. Until they start just saying <laughs> Taylor, <laughs> you can't do it. <laughs> even then, don't do it. <laughs> don't do even it. Even at that point, reconsider. Just stay over there. So, in the political side of in the national news, black and brown and green, the CBD and black and Latino access to entrepreneurship. So there's been a large influx of CBD products. It has. One of the most disturbing influx of that was when somebody coerced me into going to a five links gathering, which I thought was a true meeting to get into their pyramid scheme. <laughs> <laughs> you were set up. I got, I got caught in another MLM situation. <laughs> Don't you hate that? You be like, wait a minute. I thought we were here to talk about some stuff, and you over here pushing your product. Look, at least if you're going to have me in an MLM, at least have good food. I can't stand the one that got oh. the little hors d'oeuvres. And y'all be talking about y'all got so much money. Then you need to do a better spread. <laughs> Stop it. So, do you think, LaToya, that the African American and Latinx communities have a chance in entrepreneurship? In the CBD industry, and we're not going to get into cannabis yet, but specifically CBD. I think we need to. It don't, it's not a matter if we should, can, what. No, we need to be there <laughs> because of how our communities have been targeted for CBD, cannabis, whatever, for the whole thing, right? We need to be in the space to make money on the legal side. Like, it's just an automatic. I just... If this particular thing is all about giving access because we know that it's harder for us to get into the industry, then yes, Everybody who's interested, y'all need to sign up today. And I don't know how this is going to work as far as the restoration of the pipeline, prison of pipeline, and how we can benefit from this. I do believe they're talking about hopefully uh, reducing some of the sentences of those that had nonviolence offenses and dealing only with marijuana. Mm -hmm. But maybe in our community, if you get a company and you get into a certain profit margin, you can go pay the bail or get some people out of jail that are in your state or in your city. I don't know how we successfully turn it because it's just sometimes when people make money, that's what they do. They make money and they bounce. Um, everybody's not trying to Kim Kardashian their life and get people out of prison and turn it into a reality TV show. Kim, I had so much hope in you. You did? I had. Why? 
Because she's been talking to Van Jones. And at least when Van is around, he seems to get some knowledge or some basis of understanding in the people. But now I'm just worried that she's once again doing something for the wrong reason. I feel like any way that they move is always, always, <laughs> always ties back into them and whatever their motives are. Like, I just, I just, they, they clearly move with an agenda and it's not necessarily always for the greater good of others. And you know what? This has absolutely nothing to do with our show. But Kim, if you can help Kanye start dressing again, I don't know what that boy been wearing lately. But these clothing outfits. Are well, you know he got a church now, so he look homeless. That may be why, because he's he's <laughs> following a different path these days. All right. So <laughs> the chaos wrought by climate and change is already here. We just need to look at Miami. All the stuff you guys are talking about with Miami. If you just look through the small changes, just we're putting this out there as a quick bite. Pay attention to the flooding. Pay attention to everything that's going on. Um, climate change is real, and it's coming here. So just know that. Mm-hmm. So Latoya, this was a topic I thought was should have been in your streets because these. This is for the mothers out there, and specifically for women. Um, I want you to get into these next two topics. I'm gonna let you lead because when we edit the footage out, I want this to be all you. Not a problem. So no, the reason why I have this here because I wanted to be a little bit serious. You know, in these streets, we try to be a little funny sometimes. All right. So, but this is a very serious matter um, because black and brown moms, we do matter. So Senator Cory Booker and Representative Ayanna Presley are introducing legislation this week to expand Medicaid coverage for pregnant women and new mothers in an effort to target the nation's crisis of maternal mortality, which disproportionately impacts black and indigenous women. So a few stats for those who may be unfamiliar. Research has shown the United States has the highest maternal mortality rate in the industrialized world. Between 700 and 900 women die from pregnancy or childbirth related causes every year, while around 65,000 nearly die. And most of these deaths are preventable. In fact, three in five pregnancy-related deaths in the nation were preventable, according to the new report by the CDC released Tuesday. So the maximizing outcomes for moms through Medicaid improvement and enhancement of services, which is also called the Mommies Act, uh, Cory Booker actually introduced last year, and it extends coverage for new moms from its current standard of 60 days after childbirth to a full year of coverage, offers full Medicaid coverage for pregnant women and new mothers, instead of just covering pregnancy care, increases access to primary health providers and women's health providers, and it also increases access to doula care. So the legislation has been endorsed by more than a dozen organizations, including health providers and women advocates. In the United States, we currently face the highest risk of illness, complications, and even death due to the lack of quality maternal care And more egregiously, institutional bias and racism rampant in our hospitals and healthcare systems. And this was a quote by Elizabeth Dawes Gay and Angela Doinsola Aina, co-directors of Black Mamas Matter Alliance. And that's what they gave Refinery29 in an article about the topic. So this particular bill that um, Cory Booker and Representative Ayanna Pressley are introducing is one of some that have been introduced. So we know that Kamala Harris has talked about it as well. Elizabeth Warren has introduced this as a topic for her presidency campaign. And it's beyond time. We know Serena Williams, she was very vocal about her experience. Uh, Beyonce, when she did the homecoming um, documentary on Netflix, she talked about her experience with giving birth to the twins. And it's interesting because there's been talks before about how doctors often look at complaints or sort of um, flag raising by black patients differently than from white patients because it is believed that black people have a higher tolerance for pain. So the complaints or the saying like, hey, something's going wrong, isn't always read or reacted to the same coming from someone who is black which often leads to why a lot of these deaths are preventable. So to have this being a topic, this campaign year is huge, 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 huge. And it's beyond time. I think one of the things that worries me the most as the 
opportunity of being a potential father, you hear issues like this and you don't even know these kind of things are going on. Like to read this is it's actually scary. Um, and it's a very real situation, very real. And that's one of the things I know we talked about it before, not necessarily this season on Tap Beats and Bites, but probably last season about how important it was for me to take so much control of my pregnancy and how I gave birth to Takari because I was aware of these certain things. And so there, are, when you go to your OBGYN, and a lot of times if you're doing a traditional birth, your OBGYN may not be the doctor who delivers your baby. You may go in and have a whole new doctor who does not know you be the one to deliver your baby. And there's a documentary on um, that Ricky Lake did. It's called like the business of ha giving birth or something like that. But you can look it up and it sort of talks about a lot of this and how the hospitals are set up. Hospitals are not set up for wellness or for care in that instance, right? Hospitals are set up to help people sort of fix things it's, it's a very surgical procedure and giving birth is not surgery it's not a disease it is an act that our bodies are made and equipped to do so that's one of the things i really like when i saw that this is all about this includes access to doula care because doulas are especially if you're in a hospital i definitely recommend that you get a doula because a doula can be that sort of median mediator between you and, your, and the doctor and the staff because they can help to speak up for you if you're in pain they can sit there and make sure that your birthing plan is actually being followed or if it's not that you understand why it's not maybe something's going on and you need to act differently or make a different decision but to have someone who can sort of act in your behalf because when you're in the process of giving birth you are very much focused on the moment and it is a very intense experience. So to know that and to realize that you have these acts and these bills that are being put in front of us, we need to be active in this experience. We need to be active. And again, this just speaks to why it's so important that this election year is, is extremely relevant and necessary for us because these things are important for everybody. We're talking about the, the human population. We're talking about the population of the United States. So for kids to be born to then now have, to be born without having mothers because their mothers died during this process, you're just, it just, it just makes for a very disabled, disabled and a very unstable, is what I was trying to say, excuse me, y'all, um, situation for the kids as they're growing up. I mean, and I just hope with the basis of these things being put into place, you know, I know they were talking about even going to the hospital. I mean, just going to the doctor in general. Like, if you're refused something, then make yeah. sure it's documented on your charts. Um, because yeah. that's just how they're treating us. And this is just going to go into one of our closing conversations. Just this is what not what just women are going through. This is specifically what black and brown women are going through when given childbirth. Like, these are the issues that we're dealing with. Yeah, we got to pay attention. So... The last heavy topic before we get into it, um, the governor's, Georgia's governor signs a controversial abortion bill into law, the fetal heart bill. Uh, mm -hmm. The guy that stole the election, because he was the, the judge, the jury, and the referee when he was running, Governor Kemp has signed into law state fetal heartbeat bill, a piece of legislation that would prohibit abortion after a heartbeat is detected in an embryo. That is something that usually happens between five and six weeks into a woman's pregnancy before the women know they are even pregnant. Um, the bill appears to be a violation of Roe versus Wade, which we see the Republicans seem to care nothing about, mm -mm. which was a landmark decision made in 1973 Supreme Court. This uh, was put into place to protect women's right to abortion up until when the fetus is viable, which typically happens between 24 to 25 weeks. Right, around the three month mark. So that would be your first trimester, right? Mm -hmm. The American Civil Liberties Union and the Center of Reproductive Rights have promised to challenge the legislation long before it goes into effect in January 2020. That's not that long away. I just want you to know that. That's only six, uh, seven months away. 15 states has introduced similar legislation this year, and governors of Kentucky, Mississippi, Ohio have signed theirs into law. None of these laws have been successfully enacted, according to the Reproductive Health Research Organization, and the Good Matcher Institute. Um, Stacey Abrams, which should have been our governor and should be known as Governor Abrams. Bad policies like the forced pregnancy bill are a direct result of voter suppression. 
do you agree with their sentiments and what are your thoughts? I mean, first of all, I'm not even really asking you that. I'm asking people out there because mm-hmm. I already know how Latoya feels. That this is this is just a tragedy. Um, there's no other way to put it. This is a tragedy. Right. And, you know, we know that the Republicans have been trying to overturn Roe versus Wade. Not a surprise there. And it, again, speaks to men making decisions about women's bodies, a place that they should not be. Um, And we know that things happen and women can become pregnant for reasons that were not consensual, right? It wasn't a mutual experience to where she was engaged in, in lovemaking and then they birthed, they're bringing forth a new life. Things happen, things go wrong. We know that human trafficking is a huge issue in the U.S. Rape still occurs. You have tons of different things that happen. So oftentimes women who are seeking to have an abortion, there there's a strong reason why. Uh, having an abortion, I've never gone through the experience, but I know people who have. It's not uh something that you just do and you just get back into life the next day no you've had a living entity cut from your body there's an experience there and to act as if and i get it if you're pro-life and you're like well all lives should you know but you just you should not be the one to make that call the woman should be the one to make that call her and her family and whoever else is a part of her circle if she so chooses to include them in her decision making, but either way, it's not their their place, not their place. So, while we go to Indy Streets, I'm just gonna wrap some of this other stuff into that final discussion. So, in other news, <laughs> Indy Streets. So, for those who watch Jimmy Kimmel, you already saw this last night. George Clooney did a PSA against people and their dumb effery. So in the, he did a really cute sort of PSA montage, and it looked like a straight-up PSA commercial. And basically, the PSA is littered with clips of Trump and, of course, those other legislators and all of their dumb every glory talking about things from denying climate change and, you know, going against what we know to be truths with their alternative facts. And he introduces the solution of the United to defeat untruthful misinformation and support science, also known as you dumb ass. <laughs> and so at the end of the PSA, he goes into various pledge levels to where for $20, you can pledge to help someone with their climate change denial. And he just continues to go up. So it was an interesting um, sort of montage or a little monologue that was aired on the show. And they did it very nicely because it looks like it should literally be something that is put into place <laughs> because we know that we need some help with some of these people who try to act like they don't know what's going on around them. We just talked about a photographer who is documenting climate change and a sea level rise, like these things are real. And the UN just came out with a dire warning about how Earth's accelerating extinction rate, and we know that things are happening, and yet you have politicians putting laws and things into place and enabling certain entities or lobbyists to continue to do the things that they do that are impacting our everyday and will impact future generations to just allow it to continue. And they do it so willingly as if they don't know the ramifications and the realness of what's going on around us. Right. So if you didn't see it, definitely check it out and go ahead and pledge your $50 to you dumb ass. He got a 1-800 number in the thing too. So some quick shout outs uh, We want to shout out Our homegirl Octavia Yearwood Who is putting together A larger framework for Urban Beach Week Now they need you guys uh, Miami Beach ain't making no money And they need that money Ooh, back so, I would not come, sorry <laughs> I would support support those who are doing something But listen, the beach could Octavia, we support you, but they're going to have to do a little bit. I, I, we we want that mm, apology mm, to yes. be as loud as that accusation Listen. was. Um, I hope they're giving you 100000 personally for your organization versus on top of the 100000 to do the programming. Mm-mm. Broward Startup wins $100,000 from Rise of the Rest. Exendo, congratulations. Um, everybody that hosted the Rise of the Rest with, uh, what's the guy, Case, and as, mm-hmm. as well as... Uh, Felicia has somebody. I forgot a lady name right now. Can't remember. But congratulations, all you guys. Oh, Miss Johnson. Yes, 
mm-hmm. have Miss Johnson Mrs. out in Johnson. There. More money in the South. Miami based Casea uh, announced on Friday that they received more than $500 million, which they're servicing a $180 billion market. They're based in Dublin, but their Miami, their headquarters is in Miami. And CareCloud, a Miami based health tech company, has closed on a new $33 million funding round. And um, that was broke on Friday. So, congratulations. A little shout out. Congrats. Congrats. So, for today's ignorance, um, guys, I just want this to be known as far as things that are addressed on our platforms. We talk about problems, not comfort. And what I mean about problems is we talk about issues that need to be addressed and issues that don't seem to be fully addressed or will continue to be addressed. And I remember being a kid and even as an adult having these conversations about the news like why is the news pretty much 85 to 95 percent negative with just that one little happy story at the end and why do these things have to be so negative why do we and it, it came to a question that a f- old classmate from high school said to me where he asked me can we have a conversation where you do not bring up racism michael Probably. There's a lot of things I can talk about that don't include racism. Food. <laughs> uh, <laughs> talk about cars. Talk about craft beer. I mean, beers. Beer is a very inclusive market. I feel like a brother with everybody when I'm drinking beer. But um, I can't not talk about racism when we talk about Trump losing $1.17 billion and having to go to douche bank. And I'm douche. I said it. The way I meant, I said what I said, <laughs> and being able to get more money to continue to build. Uh, I, I granted, I understand a real estate person should be able to show a loss, but to show the largest loss of any individual in the U.S. history for a decade is a little bit more than a loss, as well as having six companies file bankruptcy. Or better yet, we can go to sports. Let's talk about the Boston Red Sox because clearly it should just be the Boston White Sox because Donald Trump's White House has, of course, had a notation of a lot of people of color skipping any of the celebrations of, you know, winning a championship or winning something and going to the White House. The manager, Alex Cora, a critic of Trump's administration um, and his inexcusable treatment to Puerto Rico, which Trump was saying Puerto Rico was just taking money from the USA and their president. Although Trump didn't seem to realize he is their president and that is a part of the USA, um, they don't want to be a part of that. But the bigger question is, we know why somebody from Puerto Rico or we know why someone that is Mexican on the Boston Red Sox team would not want to go to the Trump White House. The questions we're actually asking is, why would your teammates that's supposed to be in solidarity and support with you, why would they want to go to the White House? So... It seems like a lot of times when we have these conversations, as a black person, I have to justify why I'm continuously talking about racism. I don't really see anybody asking Jews to justify why they talk about the Holocaust. We're not going to forget what happened, and we're definitely not going to forget 400 years of it just because you want us to and you think things are a little bit better. Or furthermore, why would we stop addressing it when the problems are getting worse? So you don't want us to talk about the increase of hate crimes. You don't want to talk about Wells Fargo and Wachovia Bank and these large institutions have to admit to their red line and then not giving loans out to people of color at twice the rate that they give to white people, just denying them. You don't want us to address these issues so you just want us to tamper it and go away. Then if we want to get into law, we just want to get into politics so law enforcement should not use AL algorithms to make decisions about jailing people. Do you know why they shouldn't use an algorithm? Because the algorithm is still created by human and it's created by man, which normally those men that are creating those algorithms are white males. The situations are still distorted and racism is at a all time high, whether you want to see it or not. No, I'm not going to stop talking about racism as a black man because, yes, I still endure it. And no, I'm not going to take the time to justify to you why I feel I've been racially discriminated on unless you want to start taking more empathy to me as a black man and ask how you can fix the problem. 
to my classmates, Chip and <laughs> I don't understand what you guys don't get about racism. I don't understand why you don't know why my heart still beats fast when I see race uh, flashing lights come behind my car, even though I know I haven't committed a crime. I don't under know if you don't understand the pain and suffering that a black mother has to go through to explain to her 10 year old son how to interact with a police officer to make sure he's not shot just because he's holding a cell phone. I don't know if you understand that to not be able to be 10 years old and play cops and robbers anymore because you're actually holding a toy gun can get you murdered in the middle of a street. Racism isn't an issue that's going away. So it's not an issue that I'm going to stop addressing. But as a black man with a platform, I'm normally going to address these issues on my platform, which is why I address the issues of diversity and inclusion, which is why I address issues of sexism. No, I'm not going to stop talking about racism. And I'm definitely not going to stop talking about the races that inflict these matters upon our people. You should understand that history is not teaching the truth behind racism. Go ask your peers how many know about Black Wall Street. Go ask your peers how many of them know about them taking down successful black cities and just killing everybody. Rosewood happened in the state of Florida. We were never taught that in any of our history classes. How do you expect me not to talk about racism when we live in a country that was built on stolen land and murdered a whole, whole generation of people to take over their land? and just now started to apologize by giving them land to casino. Still no admitting of wrongdoing, but that's their way of apologizing. I won't stop talking about racism, but you can get people to stop being racist to decrease the amount of talk that I put into it. Me talking about it isn't a problem. Me letting you know it's continuously an issue isn't a problem. You do not criticize the woman that's talking about being abused. You just stop her from being abused. Don't criticize me for talking about racism until I stop going through it. And until the peers around me and those that I love and those dear to me stop going through it. When that happens, and then the ones they know stop going through it. When that happens, that's when I'll stop talking about it. But I'm not going to stop talking about racism, especially not on this platform. I'm not going to stop talking about it from the basis of politics, from the basis of economics, from the basis of technology, sports, innovation, entre anything where a racist issue is hurting us and holding my people back, I will address it. You killed Martin when he started talking about money. It wasn't about peace. You killed Malcolm when he started talking about money. It wasn't about peace. Garvey. We know what happens when money starts coming into play and you silence a lot of people when they start talking about empowering themselves. So maybe instead of me talking about racism, maybe I should just start asking you, why do you have a coast that is so racist when they use those same races to build their country? Maybe I should switch the conversation. But if we go back to just the simple basis of politics where a lot of this conversation came up, I've always asked this question and you never get an answer. If President Barack Obama was doing the exact same actions held by Donald Trump, would the Republicans be in the same position that they're in right now? The only way justice could be blind is if judges were actually blindfolded. We live in a racist world. I'm just here to report the news. But if you don't like it, quit having conversations with me. Or better yet, talk about beer, talk about barbecue, pick some other topics. But a part of my career now is addressing real issues. This is a task that I've taken on because we feel that we were appointed to do so. And that's what Digital Grass does. Diversity inclusive for a more inclusive ecosystem, especially here in South Florida. And until that happens, we will continue to talk about it. But the basis of your ignorance is to doubt when I told you about the racist things I've been through as a black man that you needed proof that I actually went through those things. How did I know I was racially discriminated on? You actually asked me, how do I know I went through those things? That's your ignorance. I won't subdue to it. 
but I'll make sure I call you out every time you say something stupid. Every time. It'll be addressed for today's ignorance. So stop racism and it won't be a conversation. That's Mike. <laughs> That's Toya. And this, this is, is Tech, Tech Beats and, and Bites. Bites.